Hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you today at Content Strategy Collective Live on behalf of Verblio, the world's most scalable content creation platform and marketplace powered by the happiest human writers. And I'm even more excited to talk about the crushing business of crushing quality. To give you a bit of my background, my name is Laura Smouth. I've worked at the intersection of marketing and technology for over 20 years, the last decade or so as a marketing leader in high growth startups of all sizes, from bootstrap to venture back. I've been on all sides of the content creation equation and almost a year and a half ago, I joined Verblio. That's where the theme of this year's CSC Live, accelerating the velocity of content creation and my own experiences collided to bring me here today. And you're all here today because you are on some side of this explosive market for content creation. Whether you're leveraging content marketing as a driver for business growth, creating or outsourcing content on behalf of the brands for which you work, creating or outsourcing content as an agency or consultant on behalf of your clients, or creating and selling content yourself. And that's exactly what Verblio does. Our content creation platform and marketplace of vetted writers provides the content growing brands and agencies need to scale. We've been doing it about 12 years and our company has changed quite a bit over that time. We've now got thousands of writers in our marketplace and thousands of customers. Sounds great, right? Not quite. Verblio isn't the only thing that's changed in the last 12 years. The more content that's out there, the harder it is to get it to work. In the early days, you could fool Google. With a few simple tricks, you could get tons of cheap traffic without the cost and headache of producing high quality content. Now it's different. Every Google update, while making content better for readers, ultimately makes it harder for marketers. The sheer amount of things you have to keep up on to even compete is overwhelming. Achieving both quality and scale is now harder than ever. And everyone's chasing content at scale. That's because the common thread between all the channels modern marketers invest in today is that they all need consistent and consistently good content to work. And we're all trying different things and different combinations of things to get there. Complicating matters is the fact that content no longer refers to one simple thing. Verblio specializes in written content and video content created from written content. When I talk about quality, I'm mostly focused on those areas, though even within those two, there are many formats, each with its own goals, inputs, and ways of assessing quality and performance. With any of the things you hear today, your own mileage may vary depending on your own unique vantage point. And quality is the ultimate shapeshifter. It both changes form and identity at will or at Google's will or at the will of the customer. And it is definitely a mythical figure that can assume different forms. That shapeshifting is exactly what Verblio has experienced in the past six months, during which we've devoted the lion's share of our resources to reverse engineering quality. And the thing about quality is it's like health. It happens whether or not you pay attention to it or invest in it. And in our world, your content keeps the score, just like the body. So at the beginning of 2022, we decided to pay close attention to and invest heavily in understanding quality. I'm going to tell you a very personal story about my experience at Burblio hunting this elusive shapeshifter. Burblio was founded by journalists. We let low single digit percentages of those who apply into our marketplace of writers. Around 25% of those writers have master's degrees. 25% of them have been with us over five years. So there's no way we could have a quality problem, right? Not exactly. In Q4 2021, during a brief respite in the pandemic, Burblio got its senior leaders together for a strategic planning session in the mountains of Colorado where our company is based. We started talking about the future and we realized our revenue and acquisition goals for 2022 were steep. And at every turn, we weren't going to hit them unless we really understood the levers we had to control customer retention and churn. We started to dive into exit reasons, reasons our customers leave us. And we realized even though they weren't always naming it, not always saying quality verbatim, in many cases, they left Burblio because of some discrepancy between what they perceived quality content to be and what we delivered. To worsen matters, we didn't have a shared understanding amongst ourselves about what the quality bar should be. When we started to think of the implications of not understanding quality at our scale, 
it was terrifying. And that's because you can't build on a shaky foundation. Millennium Tower is a 58-story luxury high-rise condominium complex in San Francisco with over 400 multi-million dollar units. It was completed in 2009. Since that time, it's sunk and tilted 28 inches towards the Northwest, and it's anticipated to continue to sink faster than engineers predicted. The tilt is much more pronounced at the top of the building, where window cracks and fissures occur in addition to the creaking and groaning experienced by the rest of the building. So how does a leaning tower in San Francisco relate to content creation? Millennium Tower is a physical example of how issues that might be trivial or annoying in small quantities and be overlooked at scale become critical and often game ending. We saw quality this way. Further, when attempts were made to reinforce Millennium Tower, the building began to sink at an accelerated rate. Attempts to make it better made it worse. A divide emerged between engineers on how to solve the problem. We realized without a concerted effort to understand our own quality and a shared definition of what it should be, we would be undermining and destabilizing our whole business. Luckily, we didn't need a total reset. Though we realized small cracks could create a leaning tower, we started looking into the problem right away so that didn't happen. We didn't have to get rid of half our writers, start building content in totally new ways, or pivot the whole business. Instead, we dove right in and launched a massive cross-functional initiative to understand, measure, and improve quality. We streamlined our tactics, just like you can. And having our cross-functional partners in product, operations, and development allowed us to put together a process using the best frameworks from all of our disciplines. It meant we didn't have one team shoring up the building while another undermined it. You can do this too. First, we tackled some low-hanging fruit. We implemented a number of tactics to identify and ultimately reduce fraud, both on the customer and writer side. That meant reduced risk of a customer receiving a piece of content written by a fraudulent writer and reduced risk of a writer submitting a piece to a customer who has no intention of purchase. Our business model is based on trust and eliminating as many opportunities for that trust to be broken as possible made sense as a starting point for quality. At the same time, we did a customer analysis around quality. What were we saying about quality on our website and otherwise that might set an expectation? Are we doing that consistently? What does the quantitative data say about quality from decline rates to writer feedback to edit rounds to exit reasons? What does the qualitative analysis say about how customers describe or report quality issues? And how does this differ across customer segments? What do we want our quality standard to be? How do we communicate this to customers to set their expectations? And how do we rally our employees around it? Finally, how will we operationalize this and assess it over time? I won't mislead you. It's messy stuff. If anyone is a fan of Stranger Things, when it comes to investigating quality, every quest for the truth results in a sticky, scary mess. There are no easy answers. At the same time, just like the kids in Stranger Things, we've found quite a bit of fun and camaraderie doing battle in the quality upside down. We've made tremendous progress in the last five months. We've been able to make immediate impact to fix obvious issues because we devoted cross-functional resources to addressing this. Reducing some of the obvious issues had the added benefit of lessening the noise around our data. For example, taking fraudulent writers out of our marketplace allowed us to better understand the behavior of real writers. In parallel, we tried to get a very candid view of how our customers experienced, perceived, and communicated quality. My takeaway here for you is don't panic. Don't stop building, just iron out the cracks. Write better briefs, do better customer research. Because whether or not we like it, we need to be pragmatic about who determines what quality is and how to understand them. So when it comes to quality, is the customer always right? Who gets to decide what good is? Is it your customers who pay you? Your CEO who also pays you? Algorithms? Actual humans who read your content? It depends, or all of the above. If you chose the last option, you're probably right. And quality isn't binary either. It's nuanced, which makes, which makes it difficult to articulate and quantify, though not impossible. We found even distinguishing between these layers and creating a vocabulary around it helped create shared expectations and language with customers. It also helped us understand and define our own boundaries. 
what is in bounds for a typical uh, piece of content from Verblio, and what might someone need to rely on some of our additional add-ons or services to get. How much instruction do we expect writers to process, and how do we give them that instruction? Actually breaking down the different components of quality helped us understand where we needed to begin. And it turned out we had some limiting beliefs along the way. We were getting a lot of things about quality wrong, and you might be too. Hopefully this will help. We were making numerous mistakes that impacted quality, including not understanding the goal. We weren't asking what a conversion was for our customers or what a conversion was for a particular piece of content for our customers. And so we didn't know what the content was intended to do. We were viewing quality as nebulous and undefinable. We were believing that quality was purely subjective and that belief was holding us back. We fell victim to a little bit of set it and forget it. We weren't moving fast enough to meet or exceed market expectations. And sometimes we weren't realizing that what seemed like customer pickiness was actually just a shift in market expectations. And in some cases we were failing to be customer centric. We were slipping into viewing customers as picky or problematic when they had a lot of requirements with their content requests, instead of trying to understand what was driving those requests. But there's good news. You can learn from all of these mistakes and immediately change things in your own content creation. First, ensure your content drives a conversion, every single piece, however you define that for the brand and the piece of content in question. Every piece of content should serve a purpose. Start believing that quality is at least a mostly solvable problem, or it won't be. If you don't believe that you can achieve it, you won't. And so you need to not only believe it yourself, but inspire your teams to believe the same. You'll need to assume and accept that everything you're doing today will go stale, and it will go stale really quickly. So embrace the continuous learning cycle, and build in cycles and resources to make sure you're doing it regularly. Finally, you can start gut checking your customer centricity and your customer experience. Assume there's a good reason for their demands and try and get to the why of why the request seems so picky or so particular. Understand what's driving some of those requirements and some of those specifications. As I mentioned earlier, your measurement mileage may vary too. We've arrived at the point where we have a definition of quality and a hard look at how our processes can support that. But how will we know when we're there and how will we know when we're making progress? We already mentioned that the resources you invest in investigating quality should be highly cross-functional. Those resources should also meet at an interval short enough to make an impact. If your initiative gets together once a quarter, you'll automatically think in terms of problems and programs that take a quarter to fix or build. We met weekly to do just the opposite and focus on what could be accomplished in short bursts and where we could see ourselves moving the needle or not. We made sure to fix nagging data issues. For us, a big one was our exit reasons. We had an option that read, it's not you, it's me, that customers often use to tell us it was them and then specify in the free text explanation that they didn't like our content. The data coming out of exit reasons had been skewed so long that it had become useless to us in terms of analysis. Fixing it required the pain and prioritization over other product and development work, but it was well worth it. Removing the noise helped. You'll need to quantify the size of issues or suspected issues before solving. There are many rabbit holes you can go down when doing a quality investigation. Often the closest thing to you or your role seems like the biggest issue. By quantifying how big a problem is for everyone, you create a shared understanding of when or whether it will be impactful to solve it. We also found it was incredibly valuable to automate earlier. It takes time up front, though it allows you to consistently get results faster and make decisions. For us, identifying writers with quality issues before customers even saw the content in question helped us pull writers out of the marketplace who would have created quality issues and impacted more customers. We also use Pendo as a quick way to pull customers and writers regularly and rapidly to get directional data as we were moving. This worked really well for us. 
Finally, tell everyone in your company what you're doing and tell them regularly. Their excitement about the answers you're uncovering and the impact you're making will help keep you motivated. And while everything we did won't necessarily work for you, I wanna share a number of the things that we tried as we started down the road of measuring quality. We looked at things we already measured, like decline reasons and decline rates, uh, to get a better perspective on what they really meant. We didn't just take them at face value. We started tracking things that we weren't paying as much attention to, like time to first action, where customers spending a long time determining if they wanted to make an edit request or if they wanted to decline. Any hesitation before making a purchase or asking for some edits indicated to us that they may be struggling with the content and that we should pay closer attention. As I mentioned, we automated things like content reporting to get to insights faster. We created a shared rubric that now all employees use when, when assessing a piece of content. We made random quality audits everyone's job by flagging content and having it audited, audited by each employee using that same shared quality rubric. We tested incorporating additional tools and AI and ML in small ways to see how that could increase consistency or speed our writers to quality content. We updated our plagiarism checks and processes to make sure that they were the best they could possibly be. And as I mentioned earlier, earlier as well, we looked at what we were saying on our website, during our onboarding and our help center to make sure that we weren't making any implications about quality that weren't true. Finally, we escalated in Slack channels to create awareness and resolve things faster. We wanted to make sure all eyes were on quality and that we were really rapidly addressing and moving on to the next thing. So what will you try? What's going to work in your organization with your content creation challenges to make sure that you can tell very quickly if you're making progress? But don't let perfect be the enemy of good. The important thing to remember is that you don't have to crush all dimensions of quality to be successful. Quality is continuous. Even if you could nail it entirely today, it would be different tomorrow. Err on the side of action, embrace an experimentation mindset, and look for fast learnings. Talk to customers and colleagues. You'll find a good number of hypotheses developed from these conversations, and those will give you continued directions to explore as your quality work matures. And finally, expect that quality is an unending road. Getting to consistent quality at scale is hard, and it's a trek we'll be on as long as Verblio is in existence. We are less than six months in, and we're already making changes based on our initial findings. First, we're tackling taking a more proactive role in helping our customers build briefs that will make their content quality better and make it easier and less frustrating for our writers to deliver that content quality. Briefs are the single biggest indicator of future quality or lack thereof. We're also capturing as part of that brief what the goal of every piece of content is. You can't define quality content unless you know what you're trying to achieve with it. And you can't expect writers to deliver it unless you communicate what you're trying to achieve and what it means to you. Let them know what the stakes are. Watch how you're asking for feedback both in your product and in any survey design you do. Test different ways of asking the same question to try and get more candor or insight. We found cases where some of the language we were using may have been leading the witness and we may not have been getting that authentic feedback we were looking for. Finally, don't be afraid to use technology to provide an assist to the humans doing the work. We could and are doing a whole presentation on using technology to scale content creation. However, a simple takeaway here that reshaped how we approach problems was to be more open to using technology for parts of the process humans are bad at and to look for a scalable solution first rather than build solutions with humans and then try to scale it. Long term, we're teeing up work for our product roadmap that builds these learnings into better experiences for both customers and writers that promote quality. We're also making quality a standard part of our culture and vernacular within Verblio. Thank you so much for your time today. I hope you were able to walk away with at least a few actionable things to try in your organization today in pursuit of quality content creation at scale. We love questions, so please send them through the chat now 
or feel free to reach out to me at any time. And of course, you can always visit us at burblio.com. And if you do, I encourage you to grab our inclusive writing guide today as well. Thanks again for your time and have a wonderful day.